Welcome back uh, to this channel. The major thing I want to talk about today is actually the design considerations that could easily be omitted while designing buildings. It could be from the end of the client who didn't actually know or rather the a designer who also haven't taken consideration of such. But it is important to know that if you do not have certain considerations while you design your buildings, there is going to be what I term as afterthoughts, meaning that you are trying to now complement for what was not designed for at the beginning of the design process, thereby seeing alterations in the design or also seeing trying to overload certain things to get some things work. First, in the order of it, could range from the issue of safety. Now, someone will ask, uh, what is it about safety again? Yeah, I would call it safety of users. And safety has various aspects. The key aspect of safety is actually fire safety. A lot of buildings that we find today do not have fire safety considerations while they were being conceived or designed. And that's where you find the issue of fire outbreak and the building is already down. There are some buildings that would stand issues of fire. Like there was a day I was uh, going through this, my social media uh, page and I saw when a fire gulped down a building in one estate and nothing was saved in that building. And what are those things you consider for you to ensure that there is safety of users or the building itself in terms of fire? There are proof documents anywhere that talks about those things that you need to consider, but you need to consider the material that you use for such building means fire resistivity of such material. Now concrete is one of those materials that's been known to have high fire resistance. So the more concrete you have in this climb, fine, better for you. It means that even if there is an occurrence of fire, that building is going to withstand for a period of time. There are other measures that could also be considered like uh, when you're considering your HVAC and electrical and mechanical systems, you must consider things like water sprinkler, things that also you use in detecting a fire occurrence. Now, there's something called smoke detector. If you have it within the house, once the building starts smoking, it's a tendency that there could be fire. So once you have a smoke detector, the next thing is a fire alarm that comes to it to alert you that this place is having smoke, which means that the next layer of it could be leading to fire. Now, these are not things that should be overlooked in the building. We also see some cases where, yeah, you have houses like in the kitchen and nobody has a fire extinguisher. That's quite bad. Even though that is not a design measure, it's, a, it's a, a use and a criteria that it should be used for fighting if actually it occurs. In addition to that, uh, when designing for such considerations, you should consider emergency exits. Because if fire engulfs a space, one thing that is very key is to save the, the users of that space. So there should be emergency exits for those who use such spaces, there should even be what is called compartment for safety, whereby even though other spaces did not have that resistance of fire, but those compartments for safety should be that which can protect whatever is in that space for a period of maybe one hour, one hour, 30 minutes, so that the firefighters could actually get close or get arrived to save such situation. These things, if they are provided, there should also be adequate signages to indicate that a particular route is for fire exits. So that there will be no, you know, when there is fire, already there is pandemonium. People will be running helter skelter, both in public or in residential buildings, if they don't know the route to take. For instance, you can find somebody running to the entrance where the person should be running to the exit, you know. So this is very important consideration. The next aspect or uh, consideration that is very important is natural lighting and uh, ventilation. This has been flagged everywhere in design, but you know, sometimes it's being said, natural lighting and ventilation, and you still find that that lighting and ventilation is not optimum. 
So, a consideration of salt is very important because it is not just for the well-being of the occupants of the building, but it's also very important for efficiency and cost savings in the building. Let me give you an instance. If you come into a room that has one window, very fair enough in, in such in, in different climates, I'm talking now in respect to the warm, humid climate, you will need to have another window for you to experience a flow. And no matter how the temperature is, let's say you have a temperature of about 23 degrees and it is moving, you are not going to feel hot. But you have a temperature of 22, 23 degrees, come into a space and it gets stale, plus the occupants of the space generating heat, the place begins to get hot. But as long as the temperature is moving, just imagine yourself walking outside. That's the same experience you have when you have a flow. And that is when you have optimum natural ventilation. Same goes with lighting. Let me show you an illustration as a, a designer. Typically, for instance, if you have a space, let's say you have uh, this as your effective room space. There are options to consider depending on the location of your building. Let's say this is part of a whole. So if this is the building we are considering, the, the highlighted area. Now, you can have an option of ventilation in this direction or you can have an option of ventilation in this direction. Now, if you are talking about cross ventilation, the optimum cross ventilation is that which you have in a, a vertical direction. The diagonal will give you cross ventilation, but the vertical will give you optimum cross ventilation. And imagine you have, if you have a space like uh, this and you have two windows at one end and you have one window at the other end, what happens here is that air comes in from here and goes out from here it comes in from here the same thing happens to this you see that so uh, the shaded area becomes the airflow into the space it comes in saturates the space then finds a way to exit you know and once the air comes out let me give you a section of this illustration taking this to be a wall if you if you cut a section through this line what you will be having here is you have your wall, which is wall A, and uh, you have your wall B, which is this. So if you have these two walls, for instance, and this is your space, air comes in through here. As it comes in, this is what you have. It begins to saturate the space. The next thing is, if there is no window, when it comes in, it begins to recycle around and it gets hot. But if it comes in and finds way to go out, what happens there? You have optimum thermal comfort. So look at this. If you introduce a window at this other end, are you seeing what happens? The human being who is going to be in this space experiences optimum thermal comfort because he is going to have an experience you know the, the area that experiences air very well is the, from the head to the mid region of the body so if the person is lying down let's assume that there's a bed in this room are you seeing this level it means that if you have a bed at this point and you have this it means that the person will be lying down and the airflow will be sufficient enough for the person to inhale fresh air. If the person is standing up, the person will also experience fresh air. What else would you benefit from this? In terms of lighting, look at the incidence of light. If you take the sun angle, depending on the direction it's coming from, light will be able to enter the room sufficiently. So it means that more than two-thirds of the space will be naturally lit and if you have also light coming from this other end more than two thirds will be naturally lit so the entire region of the room span will be effectively lit so you have your lighting effectively ventilation effectively this becomes a very important consideration because if you do not have such what would you experience you will experience dark spaces 
in the daytime and what would you need you need to begin to put on lights and that light will consume energy whether it is renewable energy it would have been stored to be used when there is no sunlight especially when it is in solar and uh, if it is something that requires maybe fun or yeah fun to help drive the air in the space you will also need energy to do that so you see it now helps you to save energy for when it is very important to use if the space is not well ventilated the side effect is that you will have moles grow on your wall because of humidity and this has posed a lot of health issues to many persons and as a designer as an architect you need to design buildings that are healthy for the users so ventilation is key there are people who are asthmatic and they are in certain re in certain regions and in certain periods of the year you find that these persons who have such allergies find so much discomfort that they they would have lived in a place that had good ventilation so that is another one uh, another consideration is acoustics you know, sometimes people design and they do not consider how to control sound and noise in a space. But for dwellings, whether it is apartment building, whether it is a hotel, whether it is just a residential for anyone, there is very much importance for noise control. And I say acoustics because noise control is one of those things that if you are in a space, and you experience the sound that you do not need in that space it is a problem you know it would discomfort there are certain people that such sounds they make their mind not to be at rest it could disturb their mental stability so issues like insulation between doors for instance your door should be such that it has acoustic proof or acoustic rating how much sound should pass through your door there should be if you're designing a space there should be effective noise control from one unit or from one space to the other i should not be in a bedroom and i am hearing sound from another bedroom that is intrusion of one's privacy remember that these spaces are classified for instance in the residential building we have the living area we have the walking area and we have the sleeping area. So if you are in a sleeping area, why would you be hearing noise from the walking area? It's not done. So it means that such spaces should have greater consideration of acoustics so that if somebody gets into the room, the person has optimum protection from unwanted sound. This one is also very, very important. And if you listen, or rather, if you have looked around or you've read around, you would hear a lot of people talk about energy efficiency. Energy efficiency of buildings. Now, the purpose of someone investing in a facility is for that facility to serve the person, not for the person to serve the facility. Now, let me explain this further. You should not build a house to live and you are actually paying the house to serve you. That initial cost for you to invest in the house is very important and you should have considerations while investing in this that the building will serve you in the long term without you spending money so much in getting the building to serve you. So that what I'm trying to say, your running costs should not be more than your construction costs. So if you consider energy efficiency in building, you begin to look at considerations of renewable sources of energy to be incorporated into energy production of that building. For instance, use of solar panels, it has become very important that such things should be carried along. Then if you are working on maybe estates, then you can look about uh, wind turbines, you can also look at use of biomass where, where such can be integrated or combined with solar energy to be able to have enough energy to sustain a facility. Most people think or most designers or most users design buildings or ask for buildings to be designed to serve them. Yes, but accessibility is one consideration that everyone who is a designer knows that accessibility should not be 
compromised. Now, accessibility has various aspects. Your user for a particular building, maybe residential building, could be you find someone in a certain state of uh, ability. And uh, what is actually disability? Let me put it that way. Disability is when the design has not enabled the person or whoever to be able to use a, a space effectively. So in the aspect of accessibility, you need to actually provide aids or things that will help the user to get into or use a particular building easily. The entrances should have ramps and these ramps should not be put by the side because if you put ramps by the side, indirectly you are telling the user that the person is marginalized, that person is not duly welcome. So the ramps should be as celebrated as the stair that you celebrate at the entrance of your building. And also, things like grab rails should be there to enable weak persons, even though they are walking but they need support, to be able to access the buildings easily, whether it be ramps or it be uh, stairs. Also, when you are introducing ramps, your ramps should follow the standard principle, that means the gradient should be such which is safe for anyone to use, not to introduce tip uh, ramps that someone who is on wheelchair will not be able to access. Look at this other option. We have doors and we have standard doors. People who are on wheelchairs get into buildings and you find that their wheelchairs can't even pass the doors. Check it out. And even if it passes the doors, it will mean them to be to squeeze themselves and that's not effective so entrance doors should be that which will allow all form of persons both the ones that you term as able or disabled to be able to assess the building effectively and without feeling any feel of oh this space wasn't designed for me this applies not just for residential building or not just to the res residential buildings but it also applies to public buildings. There is one other consideration that I would want to mention before I go to the last one or maybe listen to this one as the last one. So I will give you one more then. The last one is something you don't need to miss because that's what, what everyone who designed barely consider. These other ones from the first I mentioned to this, most people consider it but the last one a lot of people uh, fail to know that. Okay, the next one is aesthetics. That's not the last anyway. Aesthetics is one of those things that will make someone feel that the building is appealing. And how can you achieve such? By the choice of your materials, very important, and by the colors you use. There are certain colors that are not acceptable by all persons, but we have colors that are very neutral and are widely acceptable. For instance, if you see a building that is painted multicolored and you find another one that is white, come on, the white building will always stand out, whether, it's, whether the form was interesting or not. So most times when you're designing spaces or rather buildings, you should consider the appeal and a few things that you can use to bring that out is the color and the material that is being used. Another major consideration is the environmental and climatic factor of the environment where you are designing for. And this is peculiar to certain environments because if you are designing building in an area that is prone to rainfall, the material choice for such should be that which will protect the building from driving rain and also the design should be that which should protect the building envelope from being soaked. In any case, when doing this, you should bear in mind the cost efficiency of such choices because it is interwoven. Both the choice of material and the design that you do has an effect on the cost. So you don't say, uh, my client is wealthy, he has this. No, as a designer, it is your place to give a design that will help reduce the cost in terms of the material that we would use at the end of the day. Okay, now when I say environmental factors, if you are designing a residential building, remember and bear it in mind that if you are designing for the tropical, it's different from the arid region. Because in the arid region, remember, there is less rainfall. And whatever you do to your walls, for instance, you use a parapet wall, the building is not going to really suffer so much rain. 
And it means that if you expose your walls in a, a bit, it's going to uh, have sunlight immediately come and dry it up. But when you're in an area that constantly has rainfall, you have to protect the building so that it will not have moisture soak into the building. One critical aspect of this is that particular material. Let me tell most of us here because it's, I've found that it's been predominant. Some persons using certain types of blocks. We have the hollow block and we have the non-hollow block. If you're designing a building and uh, you know that this building will be exposed, whether it's external wall, most, ex most importantly external walls or even fences, and uh, you use a hollow block, you are safe. You use a solid block, uh, you are going to actually increase the cost of that building because you will look for something else to cover it, to protect it. Then, in terms of thermal comfort for that same material, you find that if you are using a hollow block, the building will breathe. That means when sun hits it or rain hits it from the exterior, it will not get into the interior. It means that the hole inside will trap the heat or trap the moisture and uh, can repel it back to the exterior when the weather is cool. It means that there will be movement of molecules from the region of higher concentration to that of lower concentration. So they will, it will diffuse back into the atmosphere. I'm talking about in terms of sun hitting the walls. Then in terms of water penetration, by the time rain beats the external walls, you will not have that watermark showing internally and the painting inside will be safe but if it is a solid block as the water hits outside if it is not tiled you will have to begin to think of what form of protection you have or you have to provide for the building to be protected you know that's something that i feel everyone should take cognizance of because i've observed it in a couple of places and even cracks in buildings are mostly seen in solid blocks than that of hollow blocks. Finally, and as I promise, this one is something that I think is a bonus for every designer to pay attention to. When you are designing, one design consideration you should take into take to mind is the consideration of designing for the future. Whoever you are designing for is going to experience change in life whether it is by physical change of health health or it's going to be financial states that the person will need to you know adapt certain things and grow so for an owner occupier building you should bear in mind that the user will age and if the user ages there are factors that are involved if it is a family residence what you should consider who are the users the father, the mother, and the children. Let's take a typical, a typical example. A man has one wife, and in his uh, prime age, he has a wife, he has uh, five children, two boys and three girls, and also has eight, maybe a, a maid, somebody serving him, a cook or something. And uh, he's designing, and he comes to an architect and says, I need a room for myself, and I need a room for my wife. That's two rooms already. I need boy's room, I need girl's room. How many rooms is that? Four rooms. I need one room for my first son. And I need the other room, boy's room and the girl's room. That's five already. Then I need a guest room or possibly a maid's room. You've already had six to seven rooms. Okay, fine. Somebody now having this number of rooms. The children now grow up and all of them move to the university. And remember at the time that they're moving for studies like this, they're leaving the home. And once children reach 18, they are already leaving the parents' house. And at that point, those rooms become vacant. When it gets vacant, who uses them? It means that insects will begin to come in. Uh, spiders will begin to build webs. No matter how you clean it, as long as there is vacuum, nobody using it, those things will begin to deteriorate. Then, the man gets age. The wife needs to be close to the husband. What happens? they now have only one room, the master room, that they are using. Okay, for instance, if the master room was located upstairs and the owner of the house isn't able to be climbing up and down and he actually needs to be maybe walking outside to get fresh air, what happens? The guest room becomes his room. Was that building designed to handle all these things? So at the end of the day, you find out that the building could have been designed to, to serve the owner 
better, but it was not. So whenever you're designing, consider and advise your client of the future implications of such choices because when it gets like that at the end of the day it becomes maybe a village house or an abandoned house that was not designed for multiple users it was designed for a family and the family has dispersed and it will not serve its purpose and in future now what it will mean the children will say oh let's get tenants into this house let's convert this building to one bedroom flats so why didn't you just think about that at the inception because one person is the one room and the one bed and that's all you cannot live in all those spaces you know so this is very important for whoever is designing to consider and ensure that it's being followed through so that you do not provide spaces that will not be useful or wasting resources that would have been used to better lives of other persons you know now uh, this also has to be taken into consideration there are certain certain things that i've mentioned here that you might be asking uh, how are you going to achieve it by design that's why we have something like specification so the architect specifies like the issue of the block when you finish designing you should specify that not just 150 mm block or it should be 150 mm hollow block and you should specify the integrity of that block. It should be made from a certain mix ratio of cement sand. And uh, uh, if you are also considering the, the strength of it, it should be that. Which even if you f drop it on the ground, it should not break. So these are critical aspects that should be taken note and should be penned down on black and white. So that the architect will be protected, the user will be comfortable and the environment will be safe for everyone. I believe that I have done what was in my mind for me to give to you. So if you feel you have any other consideration that you wish should be added to, the, to this, please do well to drop it in the comments section and we'll look at it and also converse and see how good or how major those considerations are. Whether there should be considerations that should not be omitted or there are or considerations that could be done without. And if you feel there's something else that I would have added that I did not feel, so go ahead and put that there. Now, if you've not subscribed to this uh, channel up till now, then you're not just doing well because you'll be missing out on some of the contents that I will be putting. But if you have, do well to share this to others for them to view and like it so that it will get to reach as many as possible. Thank you for watching and hope to have you very soon back. Thank you.